Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. It is July 28th, 2016. Now, we have something a little different for you here tonight. We recently wrapped up our 28-hour broadcast. This was Operation Sleeping Giant. It was our fundraiser in Supercell. And I do believe if you go to InfoWarsShop.com, you can still catch some of the tail end of those great deals. But in addition to all the specials and the things that were available to purchase, we also brought you a ton of original content. Myself, Alex Jones, Leanne McAdoo, uh, David Knight, and the list goes on and on, all the live presenters who were there for you to present you with all the material. And we're going to have a boil down of some of that in case you had did not have a chance to watch it live. We're going to have Billy Corgan of the Smashing Pumpkins, also radio host George Norris, syndicated nationwide, and the so-called comedian who spit on Alex Jones at the RNC. All this is coming up right here on the InfoWars Nightly News. People have to see this thing. It's laying bricks. Okay, it's a giant articulating robot arm, and it's literally laying a house out in bricks. And that got me, because I built houses, and I saw the bricklayers who worked, uh, family businesses. These guys were multi-generational. The old man was building the bricks. The older boy was bringing the mortar. The young kid was breaking it up and mixing it. I mean, those jobs are going to be gone, yes, but there's going to be other jobs that take the place of those. And still, you're going to have people living in these houses. You're going to have this equipment that's going to have to be moved and manufactured and repaired. There's going to be other jobs out there, but if we don't have any jobs whatsoever, you know, we're, we're just going to go back, slip into that third world status that we're going into right now. But yeah. what, do you, what do you think when you see things like that of, of, of uh, computers being able to build and print houses, literally, you know, not out of thin air, but by themselves almost? Well, technology has always made our lives easier, and there's always been a fear of technology, whether you're in a field that will end up left in the dust because of technology, or you think your field will be completely uh, replaced by technology. That fear has always existed, um, I think, just in the working man and in the job world. So, but who's going to, you know, who's going to program these robots? Who's going to design these robots? You know, this is, they're going to have to be teams of people that are doing this. So, yeah, there's going to be new jobs created. The issue that, that I think, I hope we don't see is that we don't have enough people to fill those jobs. I mean, I couldn't program a robot to build a house. I don't know about you. I know people that could, but we need to push more people in that direction. What we need to do is we need to start pushing people in the direction of careers and trades and things that they can learn that they can actually use in the future. The, the higher education system is so outdated for probably, I mean, 75% of college graduates probably don't really learn anything. In, in college that they were going to use in the real world. It's just a matter of, did you study? Did you do enough to pass? Did you study this and do this and that and all that other stuff? And I think that there's a lot of people that are relating to this now. So I think the answer is, if you think that there's not going to be jobs, then go into engineering or, or be a doctor. These, these are jobs that we know we're going to need in the future. Um, you're, someone's going to have to design the machines, and someone's going to have to try to repair that person's arm when the machine malfunctions and rips it off. So I think that new jobs will be created just as jobs are destroyed by machines, which a lot of people are seeing inevitable at this point. And then, you, of course, you have the people on top of this who think that robots will just replace all humans at some point in time and the human element is not even in their picture that's what we need to avoid yeah that that i totally agree with you there that is definitely something that could be scary as a uh, uh, apocalypse type scenario where the terminator robots say we don't need humans we're just going to turn you into batteries now uh, and then we get something like what we see uh with the matrix but i think it's interesting that you know if you look back when uh the car was created people are like what, what about all these horses what about all these stable guys what about all this industry that were created around the horse and carriage well it was replaced with a new industry and people still had jobs be but you had to change and adapt and that's the world we're looking at is changing and adapting but it's going to be a little faster than every one or two generations it's going to be you're going to have multi-generational adaptations going on but the good thing is that information is available to us and i will point out that the uh cover of this month's consumer reports said uh, i'm paraphrasing going to college ruined my life these people are in massive debts and they can't get jobs in order to support that hundred thousand dollar debt that they have that is basically worthless to them so it is an interesting world but there will be places for uh people like you and me who go out and and report news and make horrible memes like this check out this meme guys on the camera um I put this one out. 
the face you make when you catch a triggerly turk, and it's uh, me and Alex on on camera. Someone else shot this. I think this this sh video ended up on on World Star Hip Hop. It was so it transcended everything when uh, Alex went up on the Young Turk show on uh, Media Row for the RNC, and and everybody went crazy. So put your triggerly turk memes out there, just as Joe Biggs coined it the other day. And that's how I think that's one way we can educate people is with these little memes. Make people see things differently, and uh, they chuckle, and then it, but it sticks with you. It's like, oh, yeah, that guy is a total sellout. He's a total freak who loves to talk about other people, and then his other co-hosts are fat-shaming people and, uh, you know, get caught basically being giant hypocrites. All right, I got to ask you a question about that. Were they live on air when you guys went on the stage, or were they just recording? I think it was live because they said they cut their live stream. I heard somebody say that, and one of the producers came up as she was pushing my camera, like thinking I'm going to move. She didn't even ask me. She just starts pushing my camera, and I go, don't touch me, don't touch me. She goes, we're live right now. And, and I said, okay, uh, and I moved out of the way of their camera, but I'm there to shoot video of Alex, and I'm not, I'm not moving for anybody, especially their arbitrary lines that they – that they think they develop and they own the whole place now that because they're the young Turks pushing uh, propaganda. Um, that's, that's yeah, go ahead. Cool. Because I, I've never ever seen there's never been a response in any sort of a media scrum that I can think of like that uh, on a live set ever. I mean, that was unbelievable how they behaved. Yeah. Totally. And hey, uh, if people out there haven't seen this, I think we have some playlists up on our on our channel. But if you go to I think you talk uh, so the Van Jones interview that went that we did a 30 minute interview of Van Jones. Actually, Owen did most of the talking. He shared it on his Facebook, too. Oh, he did. Yeah. Oh, well, I, I, I find that surprising. But that was, you know, he didn't do that bad. And, and he I've kind of changed my opinion of Van Jones. Van Jones versus Carl the Cuxlayer Ultimate Street Debate. 324,000 views right there. A 31 minute debate in the hot sun. All right. And uh, I, I do think you won, though, because at the end, Van Jones was so flabbergasted. He left his bag, his CNN bag with all of his stuff. He well, forgot it. That's a good point. I did woozy him enough that he left his bag there. And I think, you know, honestly, it was it was more of an interview. There was kind of some debate going on. Um, but more than anything, I think what we what we captured was a real person. Yeah. And, and I still say from watching Van Jones on TV, that's just it's just a different guy. I, I can't really put my finger on it. Um, but but there were some things that Van Jones said in in the street that I got him to say that, you know, he would never be allowed to say on the mainstream news ever. Right, right. You know, especially when he was like, when I brought up the hands up, don't shoot. And he basically took a second and said, we rushed to conclusions. I mean, he basically admits, yeah, we run with false narratives. I mean, that's a kind of, I mean, maybe he meant that, maybe he didn't. But that's also another way that you could look at him saying that. But I think that it was a very powerful moment that, that shows that the left and the right can be brought together on issues, even if it's, it's someone as extreme left as Van Jones and as extreme right as me. And he said at the end of that, one thing we have to do is come together and talk. And that's right. And that's something that we do a lot of. You've done it. You've proven it time and time again that you go out there and talk. You don't you don't degrade people, but you challenge them with ideas and facts. And you're very quick to come back. So right now, at this moment in time right here, where it's at 329 Central Time. Uh, I've, I've talked with Alex. We're going to offer you a job. We want, we're going to fly you down here and <laughs> give you the interview and do everything. And I, I just want to do it right here live on the air. I that uh, We'd love to have you out here. And I think there's definitely a place for you here in the InfoWars family. Well, I, I don't know if you can tell that I'm blushing right now. I'm a little sunburnt from the pool yesterday. But, uh, you know... When I when I woke up from my um, from my sheeple state, and I found Infowars, I I can't tell you how how much how much of a dream it is, and and I, I it's because you guys are the tip of the spear, and like you said, man, I want to be the tip of the spear. I want to uh, I want to engage in debate. I want to awaken humanity. People are so powerful. If they just knew how much power they had, we could make the world a better place in a heartbeat. And I'll tell you a little secret. At the end of that 31-minute interview, I turned the camera to you and I said, close it out. 
And you closed it out and you ended with, this is Owen Trayer for InfoWars.com. And that to me said, you were the right person for this job because even after 30 minutes in the hot sun, you still remember to say your name and who you work for. So, you even, and you don't even work for us at the time. You were just like, boom, you're in the zone. You knew what to say. Hey, did, did you even look at the resume I sent you? Yes, I just looked at it. Okay. <laughs> I, I, hey, I'm qualified, man. I'm oh, I know. You've been doing radio. You've been doing. You're you're more than qualified to come in here and do. Here's the thing. Everybody does a lot of jobs here. There's not just one job. There's a multitude of jobs, and you know how to do. You know how to do technical stuff. You know how to get in front of the camera, and we're gonna make sure you know how to edit and shoot camera. And let me just and let me just say this because there's a lot of people that know this about me. Rob, I've been working in sports media for over five years. You know that. I've been obsessed with sports my whole life, and there were a lot of people that wanted that wanted this moment to come. They wanted me to finally get out of sports and into news and politics. So I hope um, I, I can't wait to get down there. I can't wait to see your guys' studios. Um, I hope you guys are ready for me. I'm planning on bringing the heat. I think that your staff wants to bring the heat too. I can't wait to work with Alex Jones. It's it's beyond an honor. And um, let's sharpen that tip of the spear. I'm going to get there. I'm going to sharpen that bad boy. Good. That's what I want to hear. Now stand by. I got David Knight waiting in the wing. So, but I want you to hang out here for the rest of the hour and uh, pop in if you got anything to say. Just kind of raise your hand and they'll let me know that you want to say something. And, uh, Hold and on, we'll go. I Elizabeth Warren, Heil Hitler. Oh, she did it too. They caught her doing it. Amazing oh, during her speech. <laughs> but no, you won't hear the you won't hear the left say anything about that. David Knight, where are you right now in Philadelphia? David Knight here at the convention center. Uh, we're at uh, right in front of uh, Barack Obama at the moment. Oh yeah. And, uh, of course, he's just there. He's not photobombing us. He's uh, actually a standee. He's pretty much a cardboard cutout of what he is. That's right. And, of course, they're asking him, you know, it's interesting. We see this uh, narrative about the Russians being behind this leak. That's, the, that's what they're trying to push out there to get everybody off of the content. But I think also to try to attack Trump, to try to hang this around him. Yes, I've been thinking fault. about, yes. Yeah, Trump called people taco eaters. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you know, exactly. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, big deal. Well, you know, the thing is, I, I was just telling uh, Michael Zimmerman, if you want to look for a state actor behind these email leaks, I would look at the United States. States, because these are people who just saw Hillary Clinton expose our most vital secrets and get away with it. Okay, and I, that was that was just about a month ago or so. So I think these people, uh, if if they're worth their salt, if they take their job seriously, they would make sure that she's not going to get in the White House, even if she's not going to be going to prison. And I think if you want to know somebody that's if it's somebody that's outside of uh, some independent hackers that are working with uh, WikiLeaks, I would look at that place. But yeah, it's interesting, I think, uh, Rob, when we look at the fact that they're putting out these conspiracy theories. And of course, we've got conspiracy theories coming from George Will saying, hey, you know, he doesn't want us to see his tax returns because there's probably information in there where he's working with Russian oligarchs. There's absolutely no evidence of that. And they point that out. And yet here they are floating all these unfounded conspiracy theories. Uh, they've always said, hey, you guys are conspiracy theorists when we question their official narrative. But here they are putting out a positive narrative for which they have absolutely no proof and trying to use that to, uh, to get everybody diverted. I think we ought to call this Watergate 2.0. You know, they've got their plumbers now who are working on trying to control this leak, who are trying to control the damage. And it, it is very much like Watergate, if you remember. This is uh, a torrent over. flood of lies. This is torrent yeah. floodgate 2.0. This isn't yeah. even water. This isn't a trickle. Yeah. This is yeah. Oh, ridiculous yeah. what she's done on so many it's levels. Massive. It's massive. But I think the parallels going back to Watergate are the fact that you had somebody who was running. I mean, here was Nixon. He was running for reelection. Uh, he was in a very strong position. And yet he was so paranoid, so grasping for power that he would break into these other places and then create this massive cover up, try to cover up what he did and so forth and so on. And we understand the involvement of the CIA and the FBI and the fact that there was uh, evidence of a coup there as well. So there's a lot of parallels going back uh, to the 1970s to Richard Nixon. I think especially the fact that she continues to insist that she's not a crook. When everybody knows that she is, everybody knew that Richard Nixon was a crook, even uh, though he kept saying he wasn't. And I think Hillary Clinton is going to go down in history like another Richard Nixon. Yeah, I agree. And what's funny is uh, we had the Hillary for Prison banner driving around uh, Independence Square on Monday. 
And yeah. um, I was, I would, after it would go by, I'd go and ask people what they thought of it. And I had this one guy in the tri corner hat, and he said, Well, they should be putting other people in prison like Nixon. Well, I'm sorry, Nixon's dead, man. We got to work on the criminals now. If we don't start yeah, somewhere, yeah, exactly. Let's <laughs> dig him up and put him in jail. If we don't start now, well, how are we to say we didn't learn? From, that was your generation's fault that you didn't put him in jail. It's not my fault, okay? Yeah. My generation wants to put Hillary Clinton in prison. And by the way, we now have 20% off all T-shirts if you want to get your Hillary for prison T-shirt. And you could show it just like that banner that's driving around uh, Dal or not Dallas, uh, Philadelphia right now. We had it driving around in front of the MSNBC studio and in front of Independence Square uh, triggering people. Uh, we trigger, I triggered a gun grabber, this kind of uh, portly man who at the end of the video says he, you know, he wants to get rid of all guns. That's how these people think. These people think guns are the problem, not criminals like Hillary Clinton. Anything she does is okay because these people have to suspend disbelief in order to get to that uh, to get to that point. So we are right now in the middle of operation, not even in the middle, but in the the first five hours. This is the uh, four and a half hours into Operation Sleeping Giant. It's our super sale and fundraisers going on right now. Forty percent off Brain Force, twenty percent off all Pro Pure water filters, thirty percent off Survival Shield X2, an amazing product. 30% off super male and female vitality, both amazing products. 20% off all survival seeds, 20% off all shirts, 30% off liver shield, and many, many other specials. Uh, David, what products uh, out of the uh, InfoWars Lifeline do you take? Um, as my favorite is uh, Brain Force. I call it Brain Focus because it really does help me to focus. Uh, that's one of the products. I, I take a lot of products because I look at the back of them, and even if I don't feel something, I understand what these ingredients are about. I understand how they're going to affect my health for the mm -hmm. better. Uh, just like I don't feel anything when I take vitamin C, but I know I need to take vitamin C. But some of them, like uh, Brain Force, I definitely can tell. It focuses me, unlike coffee. It doesn't make me jittery, uh, but it, it, it's one of the products that I, I feel something immediately. So I would say that's my favorite supplement. crazy i imagine tonight's going to be crazy we're going to get that perspective from joe biggs in just one second because he is live out at media at a media tent and there must be some big to go it looks like some sort of castro and training is up there probably telling us how to act and what to say so uh, rosario dawson's about to walk up and speak oh yeah and what is, is she going to tell us how to vote too we got to be with hillary she's behind the girl in no the no they're they're all against they're all not going to vote they're all pissed off because uh, of bernie they're all walkouts Oh, so these are walkout delegates. Well, this is good. This is. Hey, are you going to go confront the spitter after this? Uh, you know I am. <laughs> <laughs> you got to ask. You, you got to ask him. Uh, did your mother teach you to spit on people you don't like? And uh, because people don't like it when you talk about their mothers, but spitting on people's okay. And why did the Young Turks edit that out of their uh, their video that they showed? Because that's oh, I'm get that's a big deal that they edited that out and then pretended like they were assaulted. Well, so, we, might, we might even be able to do this live. So. Yeah, yeah, we might. In fact, that would be great if we could do it live. Uh, do you have two cameras running or just one? I've got my personal camera. I'm taking pictures with Rosario I, Dawson's about to speak. I would say run video of that while you're do while you confront that guy when that happens. He's and a, uh, a girl who was big for Bernie and then was censored. So Rosario Dawson's an actress, like a mid level actress, and mm -hmm. Susan Sarandon's pissed off. She left. She said, "I'm out. Sure. I'm done with the Democratic Party." <laughs> She was a, a, a Demi, uh, she was a Democrat, a big fan of Bernie Sanders, and, and uh, she spoke, I think, on Monday night, or Sunday night, actually, and uh, uh, she left. Oh, hey, Jimmy's over here. He's down on the, he's walked away. I'm gonna All right, go get him. Go get him. All right, so this is the guy that spit on Alex Jones when we were over at the Young Turks uh, media tent. So Joe right, Biggs is going to confirm him. Go for it, Joe. Just go when you're ready. I'll stop. I'll shut up. I'm just describing right, I'm this going people. Right now. Setting it up. Go, go. Joe Biggs live. Hey, did your mom teach you how to spit? Where'd you learn how to spit on people, Jimmy? Hey, where'd you learn that spitting technique at? Do you always spit on people when you disagree with them? That's the big story here. That's it. It's all over. Let's go see what happens later. Is that something you normally do? You go spit on people? Huh? How you doing? I'm good. How you doing? Nice. That's a nice thing you got. Yeah, yeah. cool. You? How are you? I'm good. How are you, man? Come on with me. Yeah, let's go over here. Yeah, talk, talk to him. This is the guy that spit on, uh, he's like a low-level minion of the low, Young Turks, and uh, he believes spitting on people, he, watch out, he might be going for his tea. 
Hey, hey, you're not going for your tea, are you? <laughs> That's a little honesty. What's your name, brother? Hey, I'm Joe Biggs with Infowars.com. Hey, Joe, how are you? I'm doing fantastic, actually. Hey, I gotta tell you, Alex Jones is fucking funny, and you know it. <laughs> he is funny, right? You you agree with me? Oh, I think he's he's a great guy. I mean, he's actually funny, though. Ask him if he deserved to be spit he's on. Funny. Ask yeah, him if but, he deserved but, to be spit but, on. But why would you spit, though? Come on, brother. Why would you spit? How you doing? When I was going up there. He said something. I think he said, uh, he said, yeah, I'm trying to be nice. And it was so funny. And it was so funny that I did a spit take, which to me is the highest compliment you could give to another comedian. And so that's what I was really doing. And so mad, mad respect to Alex Jones. So really, I re no kidding. Have him contact me. We could do a thing together. Yeah. But thanks, not good to talk to you, Joe. Anything else? <laughs> no, man. So what do you think about this election process? Who are you going for? Uh, who am I going for? Certainly not Hillary Clinton. Uh, and certainly not Donald Trump. So you're following the, uh, the, uh, the Jill Stein now? You know what? I don't know. I, you know what? I saw her speak for the first time yesterday and oh, two days ago. And she gave a really good speech. And, uh, you know, there's a couple of things on her platform I don't agree with either. But I don't see I can give my vote to corruption. You know, Debbie, Debbie Wasserman Schultz got kicked out for being corrupt. And so immediately you, she got what, hired. what do you think about that, though, with the DNC leaks? How the, how the DNC leaks can come out, it shows the the, the, the collusion between the no mainstream shit. media. I'm with you. And right. Debbie Wasserman. No, you're fine. And then Thank you very much. Hillary Clinton brings her in as an honorary chairman of her campaign. Dude, that's ridiculous, right? Yeah. That's like, oh, so you're corrupt. We have to fire you. But we're going to hire you on in my campaign and I'm going to be president. That's re that's horrible. That's why I think this is about little bit it was more about nina turner not being allowed to speak so people are upset about that so they're totally disrespecting the real liberals right in the party and that's the big problem right so people are upset that the democratic party has moved to the right and they're corporatists ask her if anna is going to apologize for fat shaming alex and and, and you know so, if Anna Kasparian's going <laughs> to apologize for a fat shaming, isn't she like the big anti-fat shaming person? <laughs> she fat shamed Alex. You know, uh, Jack's been going through some uh, some pizza boxes, but uh, no, I don't I don't know what Anna, I, didn't, I don't know what Anna's going to say. <laughs> but uh, mad props to Alex for being funny. And I don't know if you, I actually went on uh, YouTube and there's a there's a whole series of Alex Jones hilarious videos. You've seen those, right? Yeah. And he is. I'm not kidding, by the way. I'm not, that's not even a little bit of a joke. I'm, I'm being humorous, but it's serious. And then um, after the, the spit take, he goes, um, he says, hey, that guy's been in my basement. <laughs> Which is also funny. That's like a biohazard, though. Man, we don't know what no, you no, 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 it <laughs> wasn't, no, no, it wasn't spit. I wouldn't, I yeah, wouldn't spit. but it spit. was in your mouth. <laughs> I don't it know was, where you've been. It was a sp it was involuntary. Alex is That's, hilarious. How do you involuntarily spit, spit a take? <laughs> you know what a spit take is. Come on, Joe. Oh my God! Come on, man. You know what? I would like Alex. Uh, we should set it up that he could spit while I see in my face. Okay, I think we can. Uh, I'm serious. <laughs> that would right. be okay with me. All right, man. All right, okay, tell him thanks. Tell nice him to thanks. talk to you, Joe. Alex, the kid. Alex is funny. All right, buddy. All right, Alex. I think he just wanted you to say, Alex, Alex actually does have a great sense of humor, and we've done a lot of funny skits around here that I think are hilarious. So, Joe, what have you seen today uh, going on, especially after last night? Last night looked uh, a lot crazier than Monday night, let me tell you. Last night was definitely interesting because you had two different factions. You had two different groups playing out. There was a large uh, Black Lives Matter protest that uh, was in the thousands, and they started North Broad. It's Temple University. It took a while to start, but as they got a larger crowd, then you had a speaker come up with Black Lives Matter telling all white, all white reporters to get to the back of the line. And I started tweeting out about that earlier when that was happening. And people were telling me, no, that's bull, that's BS, it's, that, that was never said. And now we've seen the video, the footage, it's been out everywhere on Drudge Report. This lady clearly gets up on the vehicle with her bullhorn and says, if you're white, you get the back of the march. You don't belong up front with us. And then they marched all the way down to City Hall. Well, it started dying down, and I ended up taking an Uber further south to FDR Park, where there was a Bernie Sanders rally of people who were very angry about the entire uh, DNC leaks, and they were voicing their opinion about that. And they were talking about how they wanted to get over that wall and get inside and support the delegates uh, when they walk out. So I actually have footage of some of these Bernie Sanders supporters actually climbing this fence to get into the Wells Fargo Center where the DNC was taking place, trying to get out there. And uh, it was quickly shut down. They were arrested. But there were thousands of people in that protest. Hour or so goes by and the protest down south starts marching north and they actually end up running into the Black Lives Matter protest under a bridge at Packer Avenue where there were about six squad cars 
At that point in time, they started screaming, hey, let's join forces together. Let's march back down towards the DNC. And in that moment, they started pushing the squad cars back. And there was like this epic battle between the police inside the uh, vehicles, the protesters. They were banging on the hoods of the cars, complete and total anarchy, chaos. It was nuts. Yeah, and if you guys can find that footage, it's from last night. And uh, what, what, what are the titles of those videos, Joe? Uh, it was protesters become more dangerous, I believe. It's, it's got around 50,000 views, 40-something thousand views. Yeah. Uh, there was one, there was a 19-year-old uh, guy named Joey. He was running around talking to the leftists about globalism and how that's a huge danger and how they need to be aware of globalism and what it is and what they can do to look for it and how they can combat it. And that was his entire thing. He told his mom, hey, this means something to me. I'm going out here with the protesters. I'll be fine. You know, his main goal was to get on InfoWars and talk about his message that he was teaching to the left. Let them understand that, you know, maybe the Bernie Sanders supporters and the Trump supporters have a little bit more in common than they think. Yeah, I definitely agree, um, especially Bernie supporters. Uh, Donald Trump is not part of the political establishment that we see that has, that has been running the show for the last 30, 40 years, that paradigm is changing. And it's changing because of the internet and people are starting to get real to what's happening. They're not getting uh, their news from mainstream media anymore. That's dying. Mainstream media is being watched by people who are 60 and over. And that's it. Nobody else gets their news from mainstream media. They don't care. Um, your your grandmother gets her news from, from... Rachel Maddow tells all. <laughs> Rachel Maddow tells all. Uh, sometimes it's hard. It's hard to go over there, but we love we I, love our Grammy. I'm and, still curious whether or not Rachel Maddow and Chris uh, Hayes are two people or the one and the same, and they just decide to change. I think they change know. glasses. Well, no, it, they change glasses whole, and Rachel shaves before they go. It's, it's, it's a gender. Maybe it's like a gender identification, the confusion issue, where one day they're a guy, one day they're a girl. They don't know. They're really confused still about it. I don't know. George Norrie is somebody, because I later was told this by Clear Channel executives, he probably doesn't want me telling the story, or he can tell me it's inaccurate, but I was told this by some honorable folks that later left the company just a few years ago. He put his job on the line in 2003. He had a top-rated show. He'd won uh, TV, you know, his highest credits, uh, Emmys, three of them or four of them. He'd been, of course, a naval officer and just done a lot of other amazing things, and he was being you know, taken over the show and took it from 500 stations over 600 to be the second largest syndicated show in the world. That's on at night, so it beats the daytime shows. I want to talk about his courage, though, as a trailblazer. He took the show from 80% UFOs, which is interesting, to like 80% New World Order, world governments, you know, vaccinations are dangerous. And he put his job on the line. And I happen to know for a fact that, uh, I don't think I've ever even told him this story, but when he finally set me up for the show, we had record ratings, it was on national TV the next day that they had me on. C-SPAN, CNN reported on, they were very scared of it, that, uh, you know, there were people telling me, look, uh, they're putting, they're wanting George to fail. Some people, they're, they're doing this, and they think that this is how they're going to bring him down after he'd only been doing the show a year and a half and to take it to the highest ratings ever. And they had a replacement host ready, and uh, George Norrie said, I'm putting Alex Jones on the ear. And you know what? It's the chain reaction that led to so much of this. And, and then Matt Drudge, a whole other level, DrudgeReport.com. And, and look, it, it, it's not about thinking people that helped me. They, they were patriots a decade ago or more when no one would talk about this. You'd get audited, you'd get arrested, you'd get beat up. I used to get audited and beat up in parking lots for this stuff. And so, George, you know, I love you, brother, and it's always good seeing you, and I hate to kiss your butt, but people need to know how amazing you are. You know, it's not just Donald Trump today or Ron Paul or you know, any of these people or Nigel Farage. Uh, you, you went through a lot. Now, I know you know part of this story, but over the years, I got the full story from different levels. W w uh, I mean, were you threatened like, like, like I was before I came on? I was never threatened, uh, Alex, uh, directly. It always came to me by word of mouth from other people. And, you know, they, they kept, like, dodging the bullet. We were never able to hone down and find out exactly who are they, what are they. But they kept coming at me in different ways. But, you know, we kept fighting. I and mean, we did exactly what you said. We took a show that was successful and popular that would not have continued in this society today had I not made the changes that I had to You make. are a total visionary. Had to do it. Had to do it. Well, you know, George, George, anything I can ever do for you, 
Uh, I mean, I want you to know how much I admire you in this in this world of cowards. You are such a freaking man. Well, you already do, my friend. You've been very helpful to my family, and you're one heck of a guy, and we think the world of, of you. And I, I'm telling you, the best thing I ever did in this in this show was sticking my neck out, putting Alex Jones on our radio show, because we proved to the people that there's more to what's going on in this life than just strange and unusual things. And you I'd care like so much, I'm going to go further, because, George, you're holding back here, okay, but I know everything. You helped get me on XM and Sirius. Well, your ability got you on. No, I know, but you met with the presidents and the people and jumped through the hoops, to do, even though I, the Court Channel never put other people's shows on. They did that because there were some patriots there. Uh, so I, I just want to commend you, man. I, look, 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 George, I know everything you did. And I appreciate you. Uh, that's okay, my friend. Now, you, how many hours are you into this operation here? Well, I mean, we're doing 28, but I've only done four so far, and I'm back for a few hours, and I'm back in the morning and back in the afternoon. Uh, we're trying to fundraise, you know, in this crazy economy, trying to build and fight, where we've got 40% specials on Brain Force and a lot of other specials, 40% off of storable foods and 20% uh, off on uh, water filters and stuff like that. But, but tell me about your view of Donald Trump, the world events, the crossroads, the Democratic Party, the emails. I mean, what's front and center? What's coming up on Coast to Coast AM tonight at a midnight central? Uh, it's uh, 10, uh, 10 p.m. Pacific. We've got lots going on coast to coast tonight, but we start with our round robin of the world events, Alex. I've got a correspondent at the uh, Republic of the, at the Democratic National Convention in Philadelphia. We've got uh, people all over the place commenting. Uh, Dr. John Curtis, Howard Bloom, our experts on the primaries are going to be talking and giving reaction, as they have during the Republican convention last week. And then we'll go into our typical coast-to-coast -coast shows. We'll have some fun. We're going to talk about metaphysical things. But i got to tell you, this is the strangest election year for the presidency I have ever seen, ever witnessed in my life. And um, we don't endorse on coast-to-coast. -coast. I try not to do that. I want to bring out all the views, let people make up their own minds who they want. I'll bring out people who are for Trump and against Trump. I'll bring out people who are for Hillary and against Hillary. Sure, but I can tell overall you're a libertarian, you're for Trump. I'm a libertarian generally. I go right down the middle of the road and I call it the way I see it. I mean, people were talking about me running for the presidency. I would have offered the BP slot to Condoleezza Rice and the cabinet would have been made up of libertarians, Democrats, and Republicans. Sure, big The tent. best people. I want the I want the best people. Well, the party sure. bosses don't want unification. In your gut, George Norrie, coast to coast AM dot com. Who's going to win this election? I think it's Trump. Well, you're asking me that today, so I will tell you my feelings based on today. I will preface it by saying that events can change sure. at any moment, Alex. Like the as we lead up to no November eighth. But if if people went into the voting booth today. I think that uh, Donald Trump would be our next president. I do too. Uh, you know, I um, I'm not going to get an People insult. want change. They want change. They're tired of the status quo. Hillary's part of the status quo. Donald Trump is not like him or not for his uh, abilities. What he's done. People just want to change, and they're prepared to give this to a guy who's a non-politician. So uh, again, if if the election were held today. I think Donald would win. He would probably win by five points, which is pretty good. I agree with you, and I think it's a lot higher than that. There's a lot of closeted folks that are scared to say they're for Trump. Once they're in a booth, an election booth, without any eyes or ears looking at them, uh, we'll see what happens. However, don't forget black box voting. These electronic voting machines, we've got to get Bev Harris back on our shows. I agree. And talk about the possibility of these elections. Well, let me give you the big scoop because I'd literally dropped my phone in the sink when you were trying to get me on. Was it RNC last week? I'd love to come on anytime. Roger Stone's <laughs> so went on. Sleep on me. It's, it's good how I didn't. It, it, you guys broken for a day and a half. Uh, but seriously, you don't ever miss your show. Gosh, that's 60 million listeners. George, looking at this, um, I've talked to Trump people, talked to Roger Stone, and I know you've had on. Um, Trump thinks they're going to try to steal it, and he's making preparations. He's going to fight it. What happens if they try to steal it like in California, where where Hillary people met with AP and the and, and the super delegates and decided who would win the day before and just ignored the votes. 
I mean, that's even in the news. This is very, very brazen of them. What do you think is happening? If they try to steal it, it will be a disaster of biblical proportions because Donald Trump is not the kind of guy to sit back right. and get beaten and get slapped around. And there is incredible suspicions about these voting machines and how they're done. And we're going to monitor that. We're going to have Bev Harris on way before November 8th. We're going to talk about what she thinks is being done, how it can be stopped, how we can prevent anybody from tampering and tinkering around with our results. And the reason I like her is she's a hardcore liberal and Democrat, but when Democrats steal, she says it. When Republicans steal, she says it. Exactly. Exactly. She's very fair at what she does. Now, let's expand on that, George, because... A lot of people won't stick their necks out. That's why I went back to the fact that, you know, you put me on the air and the rest of it. And I was later told by executives, yeah, I mean, everybody knew your show would have a lot of ratings. We were scared to put it on XM. But George Norrie said you ought to do it. He's a good guy. Why don't more people, I guess it's happening now, but why don't people stick their necks out? Don't they get that's what life's all about, not being a coward? So a lot of people like to putt to the green, right? Or <laughs> as they say in golf, they take the easy approach. I'm the kind of guy, you're the kind of guy to want to, smack that ball over a lake to see if we can get on the green in two. And uh, sometimes we end up hitting it in the water. But you know what? We're going to get it up there eventually. And that's what's going on right now. We don't take the safe approach. We take the approach that we know will work and will help the people uh, in this country. And that's the way we've done it all our lives since we were little kids. We always experimented. We always took the most difficult way. And you know what? As Robert Frost wrote in his poem, A Road Not Taken, Two Roads Diverged in a Yellow Wood. Alex, you and I have gone down that other road that a lot of people don't go down, and I'm glad we did. God Almighty. I find all the coolest people on that road, George. I have been totally blessed to get to meet one of my idols, so somebody great. who totally like touched my soul as a young person growing up. Me too. Uh, it makes me cry. I went Back to see his 90s. concert and I just was like <laughs> sobbing and I was like, oh my so God, great. teenage me is like dying right now. <laughs> right. Uh, but he is uh, very spiritually awake mm -hmm. and, you know, so I can kind of text him here and then we've been able to sort of develop a friendship. Oh, that's great. Um, and so after the world is literally on fire. And right. so I can call him up or text him and say, how do I stay in this comfort. God space? And so he good. can offer totally spiritual insight that's quite refreshing. And we've actually got him on the phone now. Cool. Uh, Mr. Corgan, are you there? <laughs> I am here. Awesome. So Hello. I know you were driving. Are you on the road still? How are you doing? I'm on the byways of America. I'm fine. Thank you for asking. <laughs> So, okay, it sounds like we've got a, a really good connection. I don't know if you've been able to uh, tune into any of the show, but we've definitely been kind of going there, talking about Atlantis and some different prophecies, things that have been going on in the world, uh, kind of leading in with you. Just how do we, how do we hear as we're fighting this info war and we're looking at these stories every day and we're talking about the prophecies and and how we're just sort of seeing these things manifest and we're seeing uh, the, the establishment try to gaslight humanity and tell them that they're they're not you know all the craziness and mayhem that you're seeing out there it's not real it's almost kind of trying to keep us asleep uh yeah. until they're able to strike but how do we look at what's going on in the world and maintain kind of a God consciousness and, and remember who we truly are in the face of all this fear? That's a good question. Um, well, that's a pretty deep question there. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's why I lead off with it. <laughs> um, well, I think, you, I think you start from the perspective of you have to be able to understand what you're looking at. Um, and I think as we talked about the last time I was on and I got a bunch of trouble, <laughs> um, the, the, there's so much going on right now that, um, we're being told not to see what we see, you know, our natural instinctual systems will tell us this is dangerous. Um, this is uncomfortable. Um, I should have a greater emotional reaction to reading about some terrible thing that happened and I'm not, why am I not? So I think we have to each kind of check our own self against 
what we're seeing and experiencing and note where we're not having an appropriate response. Um, like you and I were talking earlier today a little bit in preparation for the interview, how vi- ultra violence is being normalized in our culture. So literally by the end of the day, we d- we're not even focused anymore on the horrible uh, terrorism thing that happened. I mean, I heard a statistic today that literally um, there's a terrorism attack going on every 84 hours now. Wow. Mm. Right. And it's, it, you're right. It's getting normalized. Like uh, uh, there was what, four or five attacks in Germany. Someone's getting hatcheted up with an axe. And then you have the um, France, and the France. what the I don't know. I can't think of the official title now, but basically admonishing the police officers for how dare you shoot that man that was trying to kill you with an axe and just got done. Mm-hmm. And then and then it's like you move on to the next story, the next um, terrible thing that happens. And they're the government is telling you, this is the new normal. You need to get used to this. And oh, by the way, we're going to continue opening up the borders. Right. And we know that there's no way to vet this. And what do you think is behind this? Well, I, I think it. I like to keep it kind of in the spiritual side of the conversation because I think that's sort of more interesting in the moment. Um, so I want to go back a little bit to what I was saying. You must be able to see you must be able to see clearly what you're looking at. And if you're hypnotized or propagandized, you, you are almost incapable of having a correct human or humanistic read to what um, happens, um, which is why you see a greater outpouring oftentimes in American culture for things that are um, terrible. Um, you know, I, I think back to the time the boy fell in the hole or something. They had, a, you know, around the clock coverage. I think even... Uh, the great director uh, Billy Wilder made a movie uh, with Kirk Douglas in the 50s, similar storyline where a boy falls in a hole and everyone goes crazy trying to save the boy. Um, we have a we have a we have an easier time bridging the emotional gap for something like that, something we can relate to. Oh my God, the boy fell in the hole. We want to get the boy out of the hole. Then we can a uh, drone strike kills 27 people somewhere we, where we couldn't even point it out on the map. Mm-hmm. So we get into like a disproportionate humanistic uh, response to, to terrible things where our, almost our senses are inverted. So when you ask how do you, how, do you, how do you approach these problems or how do you stay positive, if you actually can't identify what you're looking at with clarity, then you actually cannot have an appropriate response or an appropriate solution because you haven't identified what the problem actually is. Mm. Yeah, and it seems like there is sort of a concerted effort to kind of confuse people so they can't have the appropriate human response to what's going on around the world. So we were talking a little bit earlier uh, with Stan Deo, just sort of about some prophecies. Um, Talk to me a little bit about what you know about maybe this shift in human understanding. And while some people might not really care about those sort of things, the rulers of this world are quite aware of the more esoteric things going on on the planet, in the universe. They are quite aware of this shift in human understanding and are possibly uh, trying to confuse humanity so that we don't have our natural human responses to things. So talk to me a little bit about that um, and you know, how do we sort of prepare for this? Well, there, um, if anyone ever read the, the, the very interesting book about the doors, Jim Morrison, I think it was called No One Here Gets Out Alive. It came out in the early 80s and it was written by their former manager. He talked about many things that Jim Morrison was into, but one thing that really stuck out to me as a young person, and I've often thought in terms of playing concerts and being in the audience, is Jim Morrison believed that you could tip, an, you could tip a crowd with only about four people in the audience. But basically four people planted the audience yelling inappropriate things could get the get the audience to turn against the band. Mm. So the reason I point this out is what you're seeing in, uh, and, and obviously InfoWars is very connected to this concept, what you're seeing is we're reaching a sort of critical mass slash tipping point where you don't have to be aware of everything that's going on. You only have to be aware that what you've been sold your entire life literally is not true. And as the human system in response starts to kick in and say, wait a second, I've been deluded or, or this doesn't feel right. And you start actually opening your eyes for lack of a better uh, symbol and, and recognizing that what you're looking at, is it real? Um, then you start having an, as you, you start almost going into a fight or flight response because that is the natural response. Oh my God. What I'm looking at is actually not real. And, and, and as you, as you open yourself awareness wise, however you want to go at it, 
you begin to go into kind of a, 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 a response that is, is in your system. It's designed to fight or flight. And, and Alex oftentimes takes a lot of crap for, you know, kind of losing his mind on the, in the air, you know, going ballistic or whatever. But, but he is having an appropriate response to what he's seeing, which is he's overwhelmed by the flight or fight response of what I'm looking at is actually terrifying. Right. And that's, and I know that he's had a really awesome rant about that. He's like, you should be afraid. You should be angry. This is crazy. I mean, this is what I'm looking at the DNC and watching it and just all of, they're basically doing the exact opposite of what they're telling you they're doing on the stage. And it, it's maddening almost to the point where the gaslighting is working on me. So we know that they're kind of working with this control energy, massive head game, massive hypnosis, keeping us distracted. How do you find your inner voice? How do you understand or really connect with what that true guidance is if we haven't even been able to connect with that inner voice for such a long time? How do you even begin that journey? Well, that's a really difficult question. Let me let me take one step back because um, obviously the DNC is going on right now yeah. and uh, they have their own version of this. So this is not a political statement as much as an observation from the standpoint of an entertainer. Um, you've had the DNC now on for three days, and you've literally had for three days not one mention of uh, the scandal. Uh, you know, let's say from the stage, but obviously there's a lot going on around the event. But from the stage, you had no mention of the WikiLeaks hacking. Mm -hmm. You've had no mention of uh, Hillary being investigated by the by the you know uh, Justice Department, all that, and obviously that was cleared, you know, controversially. 